you've got black guys come up in the big leagues today, never heard of Jackie Robinson. That's the truth. Since the beginning of professional baseball, the black man was not allowed to play in the major leagues. A color line denied stardom to men like Josh Gibson, who could hit 70 home runs a season and batted over 400 several times. Cool Papa Bell, faster than Ty Cobb and with enough speed to score from first base on a bunt. And Satchel Paige, who pitched over 100 no-hit, no-run games in a career that spanned three decades. These men scratched out a living playing professional baseball on teams like the New York Black Yankees, the New York Cubans, the Newark Eagles, the Philadelphia Stars, the Homestead Grays, the Pittsburgh Crawfords. The Chicago American Giants, the Baltimore Light Giant, the uh, Cleveland Buckeyes. Birmingham ba Black Band, Memphis Red Sox, the Kansas City Monarchs. Black baseball talent was never wasted. It blossomed in Negro Leagues. Every spring, a caravan of black teams crisscrossed the country to play baseball. They took on all comers in major league ballparks while white teams were on the road and on the smallest backstreet diamonds. And when the seasons changed, the teams drifted south to play in Mexico and the Caribbean. Black baseball wasn't just a summer game. No, I never had an idea of uh, major leagues. I never had an idea. All I wanted to do was play baseball. And I believed that I could play baseball in the black league. In the early part of the century, black baseball was loose. There was no organization. Barnstorming teams often folded on the road if they couldn't make meal money. There were no rules to stop a player from jumping teams for the promise of more money. And while the diamond exploits of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig made them rich and famous, black ball players of equal ability had to survive on a dollar a day. But in the 1920s, Rube Foster took control. As manager of the Chicago American Giants, he organized black baseball's first viable league, which eventually evolved into the Negro National and American Leagues in the 1930s. Foster was black baseball's founding father. They were all super teams. There were no just bunch of boys just gotten together to throw a ball or swing a bat. They were really magnificent ball clubs. Eva Manley's life was black baseball. Her husband Abe was a gambler, a, a hustler, who owned the Newark Eagles in the 1930s and 40s. Mrs. Manley took an active part in team business, often telling the field manager who to pitch on a particular day. There's no question it was an accepted fact that Negroes just were discriminated against, and particularly in the South. And uh, I think everybody just took it in stride. They just didn't do, uh, let it affect them one way or the other. Thank God we had the Negro Leagues, or the Black Leagues, as you call them. Then they were the Negro Leagues. Thank God we had the Negro Leagues then to give guys like me a chance. Uh, it was a sort of a training ground. It was, in fact, all we had. In 1944, Don Newcomb began his baseball career as a 17-year-old pitcher with Eva Manley's Newark Eagles. Newcomb later became one of the first black ball players to play in the major leagues. That's why I never went to a major league game. Major league baseball didn't interest me because we had nobody there to look up to. I never had an idol in baseball. Never had an idol until Jackie Robinson came along, Roy Campanella. Now that's the strangest thing to say, that I never heard a Negro ball player in those days talk about playing in the major leagues because we always played them at the end of the season. They made up all-star teams and some of them intact and we always beat them. <laughs> The records will show that. We beat them always the majority of the games. David Malodger, Gentleman Dave, played for the Indianapolis ABCs and Rube Foster's Chicago American Giants in the 1920s. He was one of the best infielders of all time and later one of the game's cagiest managers. 
I never sat in any but one place during all of my managerial career. I never stood up on the field. I never moved my seat. I never went any place during a ball game except in that one spot where every player could find me on the field. So and you... I directed every play. The big event every year in black baseball was the East-West All-Star Game, which began in 1933 at Comiskey Park in Chicago. That was the same year the Major Leagues held their first All-Star Game, also at Comiskey Park. The East-West Game attracted large crowds that came to see black baseball's best. The game proved that great baseball talent, despite phantom status, did exist in the Negro Leagues. Oh, we had men about a... We had men about a hundreds could have made the big league for that concern. About a hundreds, not about a four twos or threes. About a hundreds could. They had more. They had a lot of such pages out there. Men could throw the ball hard as me. Many say that he is the greatest pitcher that ever played the game. Satchel Page is a living legend. He dominated black baseball in the 1930s and the 40s. Satchel pitched in more than 2,000 ball games, give or take a few hundred. But he still had to wait until he was 42 years old to become the Major League's oldest rookie in 1948. And anybody ever seen me throw, they tell you I could throw pretty straight. I couldn't. I came up from down in Mobile when I was throwing rocks, like you heard them say. I could throw rock straight. I used to kill birds with rocks. There's no maybe so about it. Their baseball skills were magnificent, but the life was gritty an endless chain of dirt roads, colored hotels, and beaneries. Negro baseball, like all of black existence at the time, was relegated into its own isolated world. I, I don't like to talk to people about my baseball days, because they were weird so far as you youngsters are concerned. And you can't believe that some of the playing conditions that we had to go through. Ted Page, a lanky left-handed outfielder, was one of black baseball's quickest base runners in the 1930s. He is best known as a member of the New York Black Yankees and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. You asked me about traveling, and I'll tell you, yeah, we ride all night. But you, that doesn't explain that. That don't really explain what the problem that we had. We ride all night, so what? You ride all night, a lot of people ride all night. But this, you, you can't gather really with the problem we had or how tough it was. And to us, it wasn't tough. I mean, it was part of our life. We couldn't stay in good hotels, you know. And no blacks were staying in good hotels at that time. And um, we stayed in rooming houses and around in, in, uh, in the residential section. Buck Leonard of the Homestead Grays was called the Black Lou Gehrig in the 1930s and 40s, but he never shared Gehrig's celebrity. Leonard played a great defensive first base, besides displaying awesome ability at the plate. And even though he never played in the major leagues, Buck Leonard was elected to the Major League Hall of Fame by a special vote in 1972. And in some of those places where we stay, were staying in rooming houses, bedrooms were bad. I remember in New Orleans one night, uh, we were in the bed, and as soon as we got in the bed, the bug, bed bug was waiting for us. And they, when they turned out the light, bam, they started biting. I don't think you can hardly name a, a small town or coal mining town uh, that I didn't play in. We even made baseball diamonds, went to uh, little towns and made baseball diamonds, and the fence was the cause. The cause uh, just got all the way around us, way out in outfield out there, and made a fence, and we would pass the hat around. We loved to play. We wanted to play. Uh, baseball was our game. And uh, it didn't mean no, it, uh, we hated the conditions, certainly. We hated not getting but 60 cents a day on which to eat, and 75 cents and all like that. But we loved to play, and we wanted to play. When you're doing something that you love to do, there's nothing lousy about it. And to me, I thought it was the first step toward going to the top of the world. The black newspapers called five foot, eight inch Jimmy Crutchfield the mighty might from Moberly, Missouri. 
Crutchfield played right field in the 1930s and 40s for the American Giants and the Pittsburgh Crawfords. And then you've got to leave home plate with the idea of going to second base. Otherwise, you can't run to first base, and then if the guy bobbles the ball, make up your mind to go to second. You've got to leave home plate with the intention of going to second base. That's what they call coming to the park to play ball. They put me in the ball game to catch, too. In fact, that was, I think, my first night game. They had little lights in Beach Haven, New Jersey. And I caught, and I'll never forget riding to New York after the game in the bus, and they were getting ready to go through the, what, the Holland Tunnel. So the other players on the team asked me, did I have a gas mask? And I said, no. I said, well, you know, going through the tunnel, you need a gas mask. So. Life was always tough on a rookie, even if your name was Roy Campanella. Campy began his career with the Baltimore Elite Giants of the Negro National League in 1937. Ten years later, he went on to become a Hall of Fame catcher with the Brooklyn Dodgers before a paralyzing auto accident cut short his career in 1958. I was 15 now. So then at the hotel, that Saturday morning when I got up, so what, the general manager of the team, McGowan, asked me, did I make up my bed? I said, no. I said, well, you leave a bad reputation for the team. You got to go upstairs and make your bed up. So I got the elevator and upstairs I went and made my bed up. I come back down. So he said, look, I have a bucket here. Go downstairs and get me a bucket of steam. So I said, OK. So on my way, I said, how am I going to get a bucket of steam? And. <laughs> That's when I started to realize these guys was pulling something on me. Uh, one other thing, too, you know, they used to dust us off a lot, you know, threw the ball out of our face or head or anywhere, see. And uh, we had that to think about. And uh, at that time, we weren't wearing any helmets. And then neither were they putting uh, pictures out of the ball game for throwing that if you were finding them. And uh, we, had, we had to learn how to duck as well as hit. So that put some mess on your mind, see. Yeah, I think I punched a guy once. I punched a ball player one time. And by the way, it was down in Long Island who was playing. I played, punched the ball player, played first base. When I went down, instead of him tagging the bag this way, he stuck his foot out and I went over him. And I tripped over him. And I come back to the bag and racked him up. <laughs> there will be nobody fighting on this ball club. I said, this, we're going to be friends, we're going to be brothers. That was the first lecture that I gave them when I was made manager. And I said, the first thing, there'll be no dissension to cause anybody to want to fight each other. And I said, the first man that strikes the first blow is fired. <laughs> and he'll never play baseball on the American Giants or on any other team in the league. If he starts a fight or anything, I say, we're going to be brothers. And it was just that way. Black ball players shared a camaraderie that was common among athletes. And the black leads represented a special fraternity for those who were blessed with baseball ability, but forced to live behind the color line. There is one man's story that stands out as a symbol of all hidden baseball genius that developed behind that color line. His name was Josh Gibson. And he was a baseball artist. He was a game's greatest hitter, better than Babe Ruth. His tape measure homers often exceeded 500 feet. His home run production soared to 60 and 70 a season. Josh Gibson's life is a story of a man born too soon. His abilities eroded before he ever got a chance to play in the major leagues. From 1930 to 1946, Josh found an idea.